Sydney Rio Grande uh, District Cemetery today, and uh, we're with some of the neighbors and ancestors of my neighbors that I grew up with. Uh, I was a little boy in the upper Rio Grande Valley a long time ago. I went to uh, Branch Elementary School, which was a, a two-room schoolhouse built in the 1880s and named after the founder of, the, of the, the town, Francis Branch. So I think that's where my interest in history came from. I would become a 30-year a, a history teacher. And I re, when I retired from Royal Grandy High School a few years ago, I decided I wanted to start writing books about local history. And oddly enough, um, one of the books that I wrote about a Royal Grandy history turned out to be about the Civil War, uh, which should seem odd because that was so far away. Royal Grandy in 1869 was uh, one shop, one smithy, and one school. That was it. But veterans who fought in the Civil War, many of them would come to California. And in the 1880s, uh, many of them would begin to settle the Royal Grande Valley and the Pomo. Uh, they came here for a lot of reasons. Probably the most attractive reason uh, in, was the, the fertility of the Royal Grande Valley. These were farmers. Uh, and I found newspaper accounts from as far away as Kansas and South Carolina extolling the virtues of the crops grown in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so that was, a, that was kind of a pull factor. The other thing that was decisive was the arrival of the Pacific Coast Railway in the 1880s. And not only could you grow crops, you could get them expeditiously and rather cheaply to market as well. So that was a real incentive. So as it turns out, over 50 Civil War veterans are buried in this cemetery. Uh, they are overwhelmingly Union soldiers. Uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one of the sources for my research was a fascinating book called Marching Home. And that book details uh, the, the lives of these veterans was not an easy one once the war had ended. Uh, in the South, Southern soldiers returned and were largely regarded as, as heroes. Uh, what we now call Memorial Day, it's called Decoration Day. And that was a tradition that began in the South. Overwhelmingly though, when Union soldiers came home, the North by then was caught up in the fever of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people did not want to look back on the war. They wanted to look ahead. They wanted to put the war behind them. So veterans, unless they were gathered together, had a hard time even talking about their experiences. Many of them were traumatized. We didn't have a, a term for it then, but we now recognize that uh, PTSD was something that was very common to Civil War soldiers, just as it's been to soldiers in every war since then. Uh, sadly, many of them would turn to uh, alcohol or to drugs. Uh, uh, in the 1880s, two-thirds of the inmates in American penitentiaries were Civil War veterans. Uh, others came home after four years of war and found that their hometowns had totally changed. Uh, in some cases, every one of their peers had been killed in the war. Uh, soldiers who had fought in places like uh, Georgia or Alabama, who came home to a place like Minnesota, they discovered that they couldn't take the cold winters anymore. So those were just some of the factors that led these men, as mature men, to begin moving west. Another thing that uh, probably made it more likely that Northerners would settle, settle here in Royal Grande was the fact that during the war, many of these soldiers had traveled via the railroad. They called it uh, riding the cars back then. Uh, and they had a chance, because of the North Superior Railroad system, to see how big and how vast their country was. Uh, Iowans fought in Virginia. Uh, New Yorkers fought uh, Native Americans on the Kansas frontier. So the fact that they had seen so much of their country and uh, that now railroad travel was available to the West, I think that was a powerful factor too. Of the 50 veterans, uh, I, through census uh, data, I found out that about a third of them had moved at least twice before they finally settled here in Royal Grande. So it was an extremely restless generation. Uh, and so I decided I wanted to find out two things in researching and writing this book. Uh, where had these mature men, these settlers as young men, where had they fought? What was their combat experience like? And secondly, the, the point that is just as important, uh, what was their post-war experience? What brought them here? And what kind of lives did they establish when they came to the Rio Grande Valley or to Napomo? So that's the purpose of the book. And I, I took the title, 
uh, from uh, a line in Lincoln's first inaugural, and it's called Patriot Graves. Most of the veterans who are buried in the Royal Grandy are native born, but not all of them. Uh, there is a, a man uh, not too far from here, Francis Bellot, who was French. He was Alsatian. He was an immigrant. And he, would, he and his regiment would uh, play a decisive role in the Vicksburg campaign. In fact, his regiment would be the first regiment allowed the honor of marching into Vicksburg once that key town had surrendered. Another immigrant, but this one from Germany, was named Henry Bakeman. And Bakeman and his family, we have a Bakeman Street in a Royal Grandy today, would be very important in little town's development. Bakeman had a small cattle ranch uh, not too far outside of town back in the 1880s. Uh, as a young man, he uh, was a member of the 2nd Iowa. Uh, this regiment uh, fought with Ulysses S. Grant in the West and he probably saw as much or more action than any soldier buried in this cemetery. Uh, Grant didn't get the publicity back west that he would later fighting Lee in Virginia in the east, but the second Iowa would, would play a decisive role in Grant's first major battlefield victory in the Civil War, and that was the capture of a Confederate strong point called Fort Donelson. Uh, Grant, uh, remember, was overcoming a reputation as a failure, uh, as a drunkard, uh, and uh, as he began to win victory after victory in the West, uh, he would eventually rise improbably from being disgraced as uh, a soldier in the 1850s to being uh, the General-in-Chief of the Union Army and, of course, eventually the President of the United States. One of his soldiers was Henry Bakeman. And on that day at Fort Donelson, uh, Grant ordered a frontal assault on Confederate positions that was to be led by a general named C.F. Smith. And one of the great ironies of the Civil War, General Smith had been one of Grant's professors at West Point. Yet here was a younger man, only about 39, ordering his college professor into action. Uh, Smith had no ill feelings about this whatsoever. He was eager to lead the 2nd Iowa and the rest of his brigade. And he inspired his men uh, by bellowing at them just before they went in, come on boys, you wanted a chance to die for your country. Well, here it is. And he led them into the attack and it, amazingly it worked. The Confederates buckled, fled their trenches, which the 2nd Iowa occupied, and that was Grant's first major victory. Now, Bakeman would also play a role in one of uh, the great near disasters of the Civil War, uh, very nearly one of Grant's greatest failures, and that was the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh, which was uh, named after a little log church uh, off the uh, Tennessee River. Uh, Grant's men were the uh, victims of a surprise Confederate attack led by uh, a general named Albert Sidney Johnston, and it was well disguised. They were kind of uh, hidden in the woods. Uh, several sentries, Union sentries, reported hearing movement. Uh, Grant's commander on the scene, George, uh, or excuse me, William Sherman, uh, discounted those reports and said, there's nothing out there, nothing to be afraid of, and then 30,000 Confederates burst out of the trees and fell on the Union encampment. And that, this seemed to happen a lot during the Civil War, but again, the Union soldiers were in the process of making their breakfast, and they fled for their lives. And the Confederates probably could have won the Battle of Shiloh that day, but they were hungry. So they stopped and ate the Yankee soldiers' breakfast. Uh, uh, there was a, 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 the fighting lasted all day long. It was so intense, one place uh, on the battlefield with the sound of whizzing bullets that it earned the name of uh, the hornet's nest. Uh, many of Grant's soldiers uh, broke for the banks of the river and hid uh, underneath the riverbanks. Uh, they'd thrown away their arms, their equipment. They were thoroughly cowed and beaten. But Grant and Sherman managed to reorganize their men and set up a, an artillery defensive line, uh, and the battle ended that day. Uh, Sherman said he went up to Grant uh, later in the evening. And Grant invariably was doing what Grant did when he was thinking. He was smoking a cigar and whittling a, a piece of wood. And uh, Sherman remarked to Grant that uh, we, we sure got beat today, didn't we? And Grant just very nonchalantly said, yes, yes, we'll lick him tomorrow.
And that's what happened. On the next day, uh, the second Iowa and Hen Henry Bakeman and his comrades would be one of the leading elements in a great counterattack. Uh, and everything that the Confederates had won the day before, uh, they would lose in that counterattack. So what looked like a Confederate victory on day one, on day two, turned out to be a victory for Grant and Sherman. It was a horrific battle. Uh, at the Battle of Shiloh, uh, more Americans were killed than in all the previous American wars put together, the Revolution War of 1812 and the Mexican War. Uh, so Shiloh served notice that this was going to be a, a very long and very bloody conflict. Bateman would play a key role in that, and later in the war, his regiment would also play a key role in a, a battle that's, that uh, is not a famous one. It was a place called Champion's Hill. But that was another important Grant victory because when Champion Hill fell, uh, that opened the door to the capture of Vicksburg. And that was the decisive turning point of the Civil War. And Bakeman was part of that. Our most distinguished veteran's tombstone is underneath a powder blue flag. It's the Medal of Honor flag. And the man who's buried here is named Otis Smith. Uh, he was a farmer in the upper Rio Grande Valley for many years, but as a young man, he was a member of an Ohio regiment of fighting in what was then called the West. And in December of 1864, he was a participant in the Battle of Nashville. Tennessee was in, important uh, because it had a strong pro-Union element. It was a Confederate state, but only tenuously. And the, in 1864, the capital was held by a, a veteran of Antietam and Gettysburg, a general named John Bell Hood. And that's where Otis Smith's life comes into the Civil War uh, in, in such a vivid incident. The Confederate left wing was on top of a hill called Shy's Hill outside of Nashville. And uh, Otis Smith's regiment uh, was at the bottom of that hill looking up. They'd watched already at the, at the center of the hill earlier that morning when two regiments of what were then called U.S. Colored Troops attacked the center, were beaten back with horrific casualties. The, the uh, Confederate commander at that point uh, commended the black troops for their bravery that day. Uh, but then the assault, it would fall on Otis Smith and his comrades, including his Ohio regiment. Their commander didn't want to let it go because he didn't want to uh, attack an entrenched position on top of a hill. Uh, he'd seen uh, uh, devastating results for similar attacks earlier in the war. But uh, uh, Otis Smith's immediate commander, who was Scots-born, named John MacArthur, decided he was going to launch the attack anyway, without orders. So the commanding general turned around and he saw Otis Smith, the 95th Ohio, and their comrades, the entire brigade, going up Shy's Hill to go after the Confederate positions. They were ordered not to say a word, not to issue a cheer, uh, and not to fire a shot. So they crept up the hill in, in absolute silence. And they sprang over the Confederate entrenchments and Otis Smith found himself face to face with the color bearer of the 6th Florida. And he, after a terrific struggle, seized the battle flag of the 6th Florida. And it, it's important to remember that, that losing your battle flag was considered a great dishonor in the Civil War. So the uh, regiments would fight fiercely to protect theirs. Uh, another Florida regiment nearby, the, the uh, color bearer there managed to tear his battle flag into pieces before the Yankees could get it. But the 6th Florida's re uh, color bearer was a little bit too slow. Uh, Otis Smith took the flag away from him. Uh, the Ohio regiment overran the Confederate position and then like dominoes, the entire Confederate line from the left where Smith's regiment attacked all the way through the center down to the right collapsed and the Confederate Army began running for their lives. John Bell Hood, the Confederate commander, said, I've, I've never seen a Confederate Army retreat in such disorder. And he submitted his resignation soon after the battle. So Smith would be awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, it was not something, uh, once he came to Rio Grande in the 1880s, that he talked about. It was a mystery to most of his friends. He was by then a farmer. And he, uh, he established a family, uh, lived here for many years. His last years were spent uh, in a veterans hospital. Uh, he would die in the uh, 1920s, uh, and he would leave behind uh, a legacy of, of a family 
and a legacy of heroism that, ironically, Otis Smith was too modest to talk about. This veteran was a gold mine, and uh, it was another Another one of the things I like about him is his name. He just don't make names like Erastus anymore. Uh, Erastus Fouch uh, was uh, uh, a gold mine because his great great grandson, Jack English, uh, has his Civil War diary. And it was uh, absolutely enthralling. And it was, it was very sad, too, because uh, Fouch, who joined the army when he was 16 years old. You were not supposed to be in the army when you were 16 years old, not even during the Civil War. But I was amazed at how many 16-year-olds, and in one case, a 15-year-old soldiers there were. A uh, wonderful story that uh, these were Victorian times, so people took lying very seriously. So a soldier like Fouch, who wanted to become a, uh, to, to become a Union soldier, that is, it, he would go up to the recruiting station and he would write down the number 18 on a slip of paper and then uh, the young man would put that into his shoe and if the recruiting sergeant looked at him narrowly and said young man just how old are you then he could truthfully say I'm over 18. I don't know if that's what happened in Fauci's case but he joined the same regiment as his 18 year old brother and they found themselves uh, in 1862 in a pretty substantial firefight with troops led by Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. Ironically, uh, the Fouch brothers commander that day was John C. Fremont, who uh, when he was in California in 1848 with his so-called California Battalion, had camped overnight at a spot not too far from where Erastus Fouch would settle in the 1880s. But this day, they ran into Stonewall Jackson's troops. And uh, Fouch recorded what happened uh, in his diary. He said, I saw my brother fall to rise no more. His brother Leonidas, only 18 years old, was killed in a firefight. And that's where the diary suddenly becomes very poignantly. It's very effusive, very detailed, and full of good spirits. Uh, the guy was, uh, was a gifted writer. Like most uh, young men in the uh, mid-Victorian America, he ne didn't necessarily spell the, a word the same way twice. But he was obviously intelligent. He was obviously a, a full of good humor. Uh, and then at the point where his brother is killed in the Shenandoah Valley, the rest of the war, the diary is very terse. It only records things like temperatures, very hot today, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that, that must have had a huge emotional impact on Fouch, who would also lose another brother and his father in, in a faraway battlefield in Tennessee. Well, Fouch uh, would find himself on July 1st, 1863, with his regiment at Gettysburg. And they were deployed on a place called Barlow's Knoll. Uh, and uh, no, no more than 100 yards away uh, from Fouch and his regiment was another guy with a great name, Sylvanus Ullum, uh, who would also become uh, an Oriel Grande settler after the war. But the Confederates overran Erastus' regiment. He was captured. Uh, he was thankfully paroled after a short time and would finish out fighting his civil war in, of all places, Florida, especially in and around the Jacksonville area. So he would come to Royal Grande and begin farming in the Upper Valley in the 1880s. Uh, his farmhouse was just off what we today call uh, Lopez Drive. It's probably no more than 500 yards away from where I grew up on the, the intersection of Lopez Drive and Wasna Road. And Fouch, uh, among other things, he was a farmer. Uh, he, would, he and the family would operate a soda bottling plant. Uh, son would become the town postmaster. But what's near and, near, near and dear to me about this man is he was instrumental in the founding of a Royal Grande High School in 1896. He was a staunch advocate of education. And the founding of the high school, because it entailed a tax of, of uh, one cent on every $100 of assessed valuation, was fiercely opposed by local farmers. Well, Erastus Fouch and a longtime school teacher here uh, named Clara Paulding would fight successfully to have that high school built, staffed, and funded. And that was the beginning of the school where I went to high school and where I taught for 19 years.
So among uh, Erastus Fouch's other many good qualities was that he was a, uh, a strong supporter of education. And I like that about him. Joseph Brewer, uh, 11th New Jersey Infantry, after the war would be a farmer in the Oak Park District uh, of Royal Grandy. Uh, but he uh, found himself uh, at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863, in the, in the Union Center. Uh, the Union uh, had retreated the day before to Cemetery Ridge, uh, where they sought refuge and waited for Robert E. Lee and his Confederates to come after him. Uh, Brewer, uh, Corps Commander, was one of the more interesting characters of the American Civil War. He was a thoroughly inept general, a political employee named Dan Sickles. And Sickles uh, was famous, among other things, for uh, shooting to death before the war, sh the shooting death in front of the White House of Francis Scott Key's son, who was the district attorney for the District of Columbia and who was carrying off an affair with Dan Sickles' wife, a young, beautiful woman. Uh, Sickles, as far as we know, was the first man, and he must have had a heck of a lawyer, to successfully use uh, temporary insanity as a defense in his trial. And four years later, he found himself a corps commander in the Union Center at the Battle of Gettysburg. And unfortunately, he thought he knew what he was doing. He didn't. Because that day, he saw uh, out in front of his corps uh, some high ground near a peach orchard. And he thought that would be an excellent place to move his men so they would have an advantageous view of the battlefield and any potential Confederate attack. So without informing his superiors, including the commanding general, George Meade, Sickles advanced his entire line forward. Well, what that meant was suddenly they were up there in the peach orchard completely alone with no support on their right and no support on their left. And it was at that moment that uh, some Mississippians, led by a general named Barksdale, who unfortunately was wearing a red fez that day for some reason, which made Barksdale a, a very dandy target. He did not survive the assault. Anyway, the Mississippians fell on the 11th New Jersey and Joseph Brewer's comrades. And in a furious firefight, they went through seven regimental commanders in about 20 minutes. The commanding colonel was killed to be replaced by the uh, major who was killed, to be replaced by a captain who was killed, along with the four stretcher bearers who were carrying him off the field. Uh, so they were very nearly overrun and very nearly wiped out before Meade arrived and pulled Sickles' men back. Uh, that would be the end of Dan Sickles' uh, Civil War career, not of Joseph Brewer's. He would fight until the end of the war. His war would have kind of a, a technological uh, advantage because New Jersey was uh, very generous about equipping its soldiers. Uh, the 11th New Jersey would be one of the New Jersey regiments equipped with Henry repeating rifles, which uh, fi uh, fired several shots before they needed to be reloaded, lever action rifles, uh, which they used to great effect during the Appomattox campaign. Dan Sickles uh, uh, would retire and return to politics and lawyering. Uh, and somehow, justifiably, that day in the peach orchard, after he'd gotten Joseph Brewer and his guys into such a pickle, uh, Sickles' leg would be hit by a Confederate artillery shell. It would have to be amputated. The leg bone was preserved, and for many, many years afterward, uh, the, uh, Dan Sickles would visit his leg bone, which was in a glass case on display at the Smithsonian Institute. It became kind of an annual pilgrimage. And that was the guy Joseph Brewer found himself fighting for. Richard P. Merrill was not born Richard P. Merrill. His, his actual name was Richard Best. Uh, he changed his name. No one knows why he changed his name. He married a girl in Santa Margarita and settled here in Royal Grandy. And he didn't let on to her that his real name was Richard Best until after she'd been Mrs. Richard Merrill for 23 years. Uh, kind of an odd character. He didn't join any of the local uh, veterans organizations. He never talked about his wartime service. But uh, Merrill saw service in the single deadliest day in American combat history. Uh, and his regiment, the 130th Pennsylvania, had just been mustered into service. Uh, they probably uh, hadn't been serving as soldiers together for much more than a month when Lee invaded the North in 1862. 
and he did so for a couple of reasons. He, uh, uh, he invaded Maryland. Maryland was a border state with some strong southern sympathizers, and he hoped that the presence of a large Confederate army would win Maryland uh, over to the side of the Confederacy. That didn't work. Uh, he also wanted to, uh, to pull off a, a major victory uh, on northern soil in the hopes that uh, France and England would extend the Confederacy diplomatic recognition. But as it turned out, that didn't work either. And one of the reasons it didn't work was Richard Best, now Richard Merrill, and uh, the 130th Pennsylvania. Uh, the Confederates and the Union Army under George McClellan met uh, outside a little town in Maryland called Sharpsburg. Uh, but the battle is better known by the creek that ran through Sharpsburg, and it was called Antietam Creek. It was a one-day battle that remains uh, this, the single highest uh, amount of casualties in a single day's combat in American history. It was a horrific battle. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, soldiers, or their commanders, were still using essentially the same tactics Napoleon had used. Uh, in the days of smoothbore muskets, but now soldiers were armed with, with rifled muskets, Springfields or Enfields, that were capable of killing a man at ten times the distance of uh, a musket was capable of during the Napoleonic Wars. So that meant that frontal attacks on entrenched positions were basically suicidal. And that's what the 130th Pennsylvania was ordered to do at Antietam. They were to attack Confederates led by uh, an officer named John B. Gordon, who had uh, taken up positions in a sunken road, a uh, road that had been worn down over many, many years of wagon traffic to where it was a natural rifle pit. So uh, Gordon and his men were arranged in a rifle pit, and several Union attacks uh, were launched against them. Among the attacking units was the 130th Pennsylvania. I think they went in three or four times before they finally ran out of ammunition. Uh, one of Merrill's regiment mates, a young 15-year-old man, uh, went through his entire complement of 80 bullets that day. He had to ransack the cartridge boxes of dead soldiers to get more ammunition. Uh, his rifle was too hot to touch by the time the 130th Pennsylvania was, was finally called off. Eventually, that position in the Confederate center was, was broken, thanks to the sheer weight of numbers. Uh, John B. Gordon, the commander of the position, was shot five times that day, yet survived. Uh, just did, did the, uh, the incredible toughness of these men is something that constantly amazes me. But eventually, the position was broken. Uh, Lee's army, uh, unfortunately, uh, would uh, slip away and escape. Uh, and Lincoln was absolutely furious with the Union general in command, George B. McClellan, and would relieve him of duty uh, because he had the chance to destroy his Lee, or Lee's army, and McClellan was kind of a timid fellow, didn't do it. Well, Richard Merrill uh, and his regiment would be charged with the, the, uh, the ugly task of burying the Confederate dead in that sunken road that Gordon had commanded and they were stacked three and four and five deep. That's how, that's how high the casualties were. So he ended his, his, uh, his time at Antietam on a burial detail. Uh, he would later uh, participate in what was probably Lee's greatest victory against the Union Army, and that would be at Chancellorsville in May of 1863. Uh, but like many soldiers, uh, Richard Merrill uh, became ill. It sounded as if it were dysentery. And it's, uh, it's something that plagued him for the rest of his life. In fact, two-thirds of Civil War deaths are attributable not, not to battlefield uh, uh, wounds, but to diseases. And Merrill was one of those victims. It's officially, 620,000 young men would die in the Civil War. But that doesn't count the men uh, like Merrill who died of disease they picked up during the war, sometimes many years later. Merrill was kind of a wanderer. He did marry. He did eventually settle down on the Royal Grandy. He was a, a constable in uh, uh, Cambria for a while. Uh, he was a guard at uh, a, a gold mine in Arizona, a kind of a restless soul. And a, a family biography describes him as a great sufferer. So he was a man who was plagued by the symptoms of his wartime disease for the rest of his life. And Somehow he wound up uh, in a Royal Grandy uh, 
as the custodian of the grammar school, which uh, stood on the corner of Traffic Way and Fair Oaks Avenue. There's a Ford agency there today. And this man, who was such a great sufferer, who had seen and suffered so much, who had such an odd and kind of checkerboardy kind of life, he died in 1909. The school children of Oro Grande Grammar School uh, asked their teachers uh, on the day of the funeral, can we get out early so we can go to Mr. Merrill's funeral? And in his obituary in the local newspaper, for all his suffering, the editor points out that Mr. Merrill was a great favorite with the children. Now, while the Civil War was going on in the East, uh, in the West, the so-called Indian Wars were being fought at the same time. And James Dowell uh, from uh, the 16th Kansas Cavalry was a participant in one of those wars in the Powder River country in 1865. Uh, Dowell's family would be important too, in Napomo especially, uh, and his descendants still live there. They're, they're lawyers, they're farmers, they're educators, so a very distinguished family. Uh, they almost lost their patriarch on this Powder River expedition. And it began pretty typically for Plains Indians. They had been uh, uh, granted control of the Powder River country to be their hunting grounds in perpetuity. And then, of course, gold was discovered there. And uh, the Bozeman Trail was cut to the gold fields. And eager gold miners began penetrating the Powder River country, began getting themselves ambushed. And that led to a, a punitive expedition. And it was commanded by a guy named Connor, uh, an Irish immigrant from County Kerry. He was the commander of a cavalry expedition, which included Dowell and a Missouri cavalryman who settled in Royal Grande named Keown. Uh, and they were going to, according to Connor, kill every Indian male they found over the age of 12. Didn't turn out that way. In fact, they were lucky they made it out of the Powder River country alive. Uh, Connor split his command into two wings, and the wing that had included Dowell and Keown, uh, their commanding officer wound up, soon after the expedition started, uh, by setting up camp directly between two Indian camps. One uh, belonged to Red Cloud, the other one to Sitting Bull. When the Indians discovered the presence of the cavalrymen, including Dowell, one historian said the Sitting Bull's men fell on them like angry badgers. Uh, they were, had a good chance of getting wiped out. But what saved the cavalry expedition is something that's pretty typical uh, to people who live in the Midwest or on the Great Plains. Uh, during the attack, the temperature dropped 70 degrees in 24 hours. So what had started out as a balmy autumn day was a blizzard by nightfall. So uh, Sitting Bull and his men basically gave up and went home. Dowell and Keown and all the other cavalrymen were reduced to eating their own horses to survive. They straggled back to their supply base uh, and the expedition ended in September of 1865. Uh, it was a disaster. Uh, fortunately, uh, Dowell and Keown would both survive it to become farmers in the Royal Grande de Pomo area. Most of the veterans who settled in the Royal Grande area were farmers. George Monroe is one exception. Monroe was an oil prospector, and he worked for companies that explored uh, uh, oil in both the Santa Maria Valley and the Wasna Valley. Uh, he uh, is remarkable to me because here in the Royal Grande Cemetery, we have a young man, once, once upon a time a young man, George Monroe, who heard Abraham Lincoln speak in August of 1864. Lincoln gave a short thank you speech to George Monroe's 148th Ohio. The Ohio boys that Monroe served with, they were short timers. They were 90 day volunteers, which meant that they usually did things like uh, they had, for example, guard duty, which freed up line soldiers to participate in the final year of the Civil War. And it was this Ohio regiment's duty to be among those that guarded City Point, Virginia. This was Grant's major supply base uh, during what was called the Overland Campaign, the last year of the Civil War, where he gradually wore down Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And it was, it, it was a mini city. It had uh, bakeries that turned out 10,000 loaves of bread a day. Uh, it had a thriving traffic on the James River of supply ships, steamships coming in and out. Uh, and in a very hot day, 
in August of 1864, shortly before Monroe would hear Lincoln speak. Uh, three members of this 90-day volunteer regiment were killed, but not in a battle. Uh, what happened on that oppressively hot day, uh, Grant even was working outside in his shirt sleeves instead of inside of his command tent, is a Confederate secret agent performed what essentially was an act of terrorism. He managed to creep onto the base at City Point uh, carrying a big box. Uh, inside the box was a very crude device. Uh, it was essentially a time bomb. Uh, he had a plan and it was to deliver the time bomb as if it were a gift. So he crept out of the weeds when the coast was clear, stood up carrying the package under one arm, went up to a, a barge uh, anchored on the banks of the James and to the sentry at the, uh, the wharf and presented him for the, with the box and said, this is for your commanding officer uh, and I just wanted to make sure that, that it, uh, it made it here safely. Sadly, the sentry accepted the box, which was inside the barge, and even more sadly, and the Confederate agent didn't know this at the time, the barge was an ammunition barge. So when the time bomb eventually exploded, and it did, it was horrific. Again, three members of the 148th Ohio were killed by the blast. Uh, one soldier was watching a civilian woman on a, on a white horse uh, in the vicinity. The bomb went off, and when he opened his eyes again, the horse and the woman were gone. Uh, it unleashed a cannonball that whizzed through a tent where some young officers were playing poker. Went from one side of the tent out through the other, and I think it kind of broke up their poker game. Uh, there were literally hundreds of what were called freedmen, former slaves who were the stevedores, loading and unloading the ships at City Point. And uh, we may never know how many of those were killed, but it, it had to be in the hundreds. So, it, oddly enough, uh, it wouldn't be discovered until many years after the war uh, that this was an act of sabotage, an act of terrorism. Uh, it, it was felt to be merely an accident, but it was spectacular. Uh, and unfortunately for the Confederates, it did absolutely nothing to slow Grant's campaign against Lee in that last year of the Civil War. But George Monroe survived that explosion that day at City Point, Virginia. There are three streets in Arroyo Grande named for Civil War veterans. Uh, one of them is Whiteley, uh, one of them is Bakeman, and then there's Ide Street. And Ide Street in Old Arroyo uh, is the home of Bella Clinton Ide. In fact, Ide's home is still there. Uh, we think it's the oldest home in Arroyo Grande. It was built about 1878. But uh, 20 years before Bella Clinton Ide came to Arroyo Grande, uh, he was a soldier in the 24th Michigan, and that's significant because the 24th Michigan was part of one of the most famous units in the Army of the Potomac, the Union Army in the East. It belonged to the so-called Iron Brigade, and these were tough, tough soldiers uh, feared by the Confederates uh, from uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana. And uh, Ide's 24th Michigan was part of that Iron Brigade, and they were famous. Uh, they didn't wear the kepi or the, the, the soft slouch hats that most Union soldiers wore. They wore a kind of a stiff black 1855 issue, a high crowned hat. And the typical reaction of the Confederates when they saw the Iron Brigade coming was, oh, here come them damn black hats again. Well, the Iron Brigade arrived at a critical point at the Battle of Gettysburg on July 1st, 1863. The first day of the battle, and what had happened in the morning is that John Buford's cavalry had managed to hold off the Confederates, led by a, a general named Henry Heath, uh, who were trying to take the town. It was an incredibly important and strategic crossroads town. But Buford's men were just about used up, and they were falling back. And that's when a corps commander named John Reynolds arrived on the scene with troops that included the Iron Brigade and he threw them into the fight to uh, take the place of Buford's cavalry. And when I say threw, they sprinted in the battle, including the 24th. The 24th disappeared into uh, woods that would later be called McPherson's Woods. Uh, and when they emerged uh, along the creek, they encountered a North Carolina regiment that was almost twice their size. And the North Carolinians were at full strength, which meant they were probably a fairly new regiment. Uh, the, 
24th Michigan had been uh, fighting for so long that it was down to about uh, 696 men. Well, in uh, McPherson's Woods, along that creek bed, the 24th and the North Carolinians locked into a firefight that lasted about 20 minutes. And in the course of that firefight, 363 of the 496 men in Bella Clinton Ives Regiment were killed or wounded. Uh, they were very nearly exterminated that day, but they did manage to slow the Confederate advance uh, and to uh, stop the hemorrhaging that uh, the had been uh, probably would have led to a Confederate victory. Uh, they bought enough time for uh, George Gordon Meade to form his men up on Cemetery Ridge and assume a defensive position. After what I'd lived through that day, uh, I wouldn't blame him a bit for living the rest of his life as a bitter man. He was far from it. Uh, again, he was uh, had to be adventurous because he came to the Royal Grande Valley before even the railroad came here. Uh, he was a farmer. He was a blacksmith, and uh, uh, for many, many years, he was Royal Grande's postmaster. And uh, the the reason I, I I remark on his his lack of bitterness was when he died in the 1920s. Uh, the local newspaper in his obituary, they were then very detailed, very flowery, and, and sometimes very moving. It said something like, uh, Bella Clinton I was a friend to every man, woman, and child he ever met. An extraordinary man. Some of these veterans uh, still have descendants in, in the area, and Adam Bear would be among those. Uh, his family include the Bears, uh, the Tarwater family, who uh, ranched in the Wasna Valley, and the Mankins family, a very important family in both business and politics in Royal Grande's history. Corporal Adam Bear uh, went into the Civil War uh, at its height. He fought during what historians call the Overland Campaign in Virginia, uh, when Grant gradually wore down Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in what was essentially a war of attrition. The object uh, wasn't to capture territory, it was to kill as many Confederates as possible until they lost the will to fight. Uh, uh, this meant, obviously, that many Union soldiers were going to be killed as well. So at the time Adam Bear entered the war as a corporal, uh, he fought a war in which as many soldiers were killed in one year as had been killed in over the previous two and a half years of the American Civil War. It was horrific, and there were tactics that are very reminiscent of the kind of trench warfare uh, that would be seen in the First World War. Bear was a corporal. He was a file closer. That meant that when his army was on the move, he kept men moving, kept them in formation, prevented them from dropping out. Uh, so he was uh, kind of like a border collie, nipping at his comrades' heels. Uh, when his regiment, when his Ohio regiment uh, first went into action, uh, just before the Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, they came to a rise, and across the river they saw a huge dust cloud. And to me, that's one of the most electric moments of the war, because what Bear and his comrades saw was Lee's army on the move. And it was a huge army. Uh, obviously, Grant's was larger, but Bear would plunge into a series of battles, uh, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, uh, and probably for Grant, the worst blunder of his military career, a, a battle at a place called Cold Harbor in Virginia. And it was neither a harbor nor was it cold, it was oppressively hot. But that day, Grant ordered a frontal assault on Lee's entrenched troops. And Bear and his comrades uh, knew, and they knew better than Grant, what was about to happen. Uh, this is before dog tags had been invented. So before they went, the term during World War I was before they went over the top, before they went in on the attack, many of the Union soldiers wrote their names on little slips of paper and pinned them to their uniforms because it was almost certain that they were going to be killed and they wanted to be able to be identified so they could be sent home. Uh, about 7,000 Union soldiers were killed or wounded in the first hour of the assault alone, which, which uh, uh, Grant eventually called off. Adam Bear survived. Uh, he uh, uh, would, at one point, uh, encounter uh, another regiment uh, in the wilderness. Uh, they would uh, engage in a firefight that lasted 18 hours. Uh, he would be in the trenches at a place called Petersburg, outside of, of Richmond, uh, when 
finally, uh, the Grant decided to launch the, the final great assault on Lee's positions guarding Petersburg. And he would drive the Confederates out of the trenches, and then the next few weeks uh, would be the, the, the ending campaign of the war, the Appomattox campaign. Adam Bear fought through all of that. And then he came to the Wasna Valley, uh, became a rancher, uh, started a, a big, big family, uh, a very prosperous man. Uh, there's a wonderful studio photograph of him taken in San Luis Obispo in the 1880s. Uh, it was this wonderful kind of walrus mustache, and he looks like a very good-natured fella. But again, uh, not only would he survive the war, uh, his family would be instrumental in the history of the South County for years and years after Adam Bear finally passed away. Now, most of uh, the veterans that uh, we visit here were infantrymen. And here's an exception. Uh, Timothy Munger was a member of the 8th Ohio Cavalry. Uh, after the war, he would become a, uh, a farmer here, but also the city clerk of a royal grandee and justice of the peace. As a much younger man, though, he was uh, assigned to Philip Sheridan's command in 1864 in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And the Shenandoah Valley was, uh, was strategically critical because it was kind of like Georgia was. It was uh, a rich agricultural area and one of the main uh, sources of supply for the Confederate armies fighting in Virginia. So it was Sheridan's determination uh, to seize the valley and if necessary to, to burn everything to the ground, barns, crops, etc. And the cavalry played a, a key role in that. Uh, unfortunately for uh, Sheridan and his men, uh, the uh, Confederates launched a surprise attack on their encampment uh, in 1864 called Cedar Creek. And it was uh, very nearly a, a rerun of the Battle of Shiloh much earlier in the war because the Union soldiers were caught napping. They were eating their breakfast when the Confederates pounced on them. Uh, just as at Shiloh, the Confederates were so hungry, uh, they stopped fighting for just a minute to eat some breakfast that they took out of uh, the Yankees' uh, frying pans and plates. Uh, but for the most part, Sheridan's army was, was driven back, in some cases in panic. Uh, Sheridan was uh, several miles away at the time when he heard the sound of cannon fire. And he uh, is famous for it. It's called Sheridan's Ride, mounting his horse, Rienzi, and riding to uh, the scene of the battle, waving his little pork pie hat, and said, come on, boys, damn it, we're going to be making our coffee out of Cedar Creek tonight. Uh, he did manage to rally his troops, and then uh, once he had them reorganized that day, he sent them on a, on a counterattack. And among the key elements in that counterattack was Timothy Munger's 8th Ohio Cavalry. Uh, they led a, a big sweep around uh, the left flank of the Confederate Army. And uh, among the victims, uh, among the Confederates killed that day by the 8th Ohio, and Timothy Munger and his comrades, uh, was a colonel named George S. Patton. And he was a grandfather of the great World War II general, but he died that day at Cedar Creek. Uh, Munger uh, would go on, unfortunately for him, to be captured along with almost in his entire regiment later in the war. And he would be confined at a time to, probably after Andersonville, the most notorious uh, prison facility in the South was an old tobacco warehouse in Richmond called Libby Prison. Uh, fortunately for Munger, he would only spend a short time there before the war ended and he was released. Uh, but he too would come to the Royal Grande Valley, would marry a lovely woman named Charlotte, and he would be kind of a stalwart in the civic affairs of the brand new little town. We just met uh, an Erastus and a Sylvanus, and this is another wonderful name, Vitalis Runnels. And the Runnels family is very important in both the history of Napomo and the Royal Grande Valley. Uh, the patriarch, Vitalis, uh, joined, uh, it was, in fact, it was his second tour of duty, but he joined the 47th Ohio in 1864, and he joined just in time for Sherman's march to the sea. And Sherman cut his way across Georgia. Uh, and uh, Vitalis participated in uh, the ultimate battle of the March to the Sea, and that was the seizing of Fort McAllister, which guarded Savannah, which is an important harbor in Georgia. Uh, then 
Sherman and his boys would uh, turn north and head through the Carolinas, where if anything, uh, they were even more destructive. The, the aim of the march to the sea was to destroy civilian support for the war. Uh, Georgia at the time was an important agricultural state. It was, uh, believe it or not, it was Georgia, not Texas, that uh, in the 1860s was the United States' most important cattle producing region. So to destroy the uh, Confederacy's ability to, uh, to feed itself and to uh, provide uniforms, ammunition, there were several factories in and around the Atlanta area. Uh, that was the goal of Sherman. Well, Runnels got in on the final act, and thankfully uh, it was kind of a command performance because Sherman was watching the 47th Ohio as they went in. Uh, thankfully for Runnels and his comrades, uh, it was a, the fort was thinly defended, so they overran it in, in a little over an hour. So that was probably the height of Runnels' Civil War career. Uh, he would uh, return to Ohio after the war. He started a family. And uh, again, the railroad marks these men's lives uh, so, uh, so frequently. He had a hunch that a railroad spur was going to be built through property that he owned in Ohio. So he, uh, he bought some more real estate. He consolidated his holdings. Uh, he laid out, I even think he may have laid out the town plan for a town that would be modestly called Runnelsburg, Ohio. And then, of course, as so frequently happened, the railroad went somewhere else. So Vitalis had to start over again with a wife and several small children. That brought him to California and uh, ultimately to Napomo, where he was a farmer for many years. But uh, he, was a, he was an astute businessman. Uh, he also started a hotel called the Runnels House on the side. And Vitalis' Runnels Hotel is still in Napomo today. It's on Dana Street, and it's called the Kaleidoscope Inn. And it's a place to be and be. It's also a place where many, many uh, uh, young people start their married lives together. It's, a lot of weddings take place there. So his family, as I said, would be important in, in uh, both Napomo and a Royal Grande life. A descendant, Tom, would be a farmer and city councilman in a Royal Grande for many years. And uh, the family uh, tradition would continue into World War II when a, a grandson of Vitalis Runnels uh, named Donald uh, was a, an elderly ensign. He'd been promoted because he was, he was a lifetime uh, enlisted guy. But he was promoted to ensign in his 30s when World War II came. Uh, and he was serving on the heavy cruiser Northampton off Guadalcanal when Northampton was torpedoed by a Japanese long lance torpedo. Uh, several of the members of the crew were killed, and among them was Donald Runnels. He was an officer who was devoted to his men, and they felt devoted to him would have a destroyer escort named for him and launched in Texas in 1943. So the USS Donald E. Runnels is named after the grandson of a hero from another war. What interests me about this veteran, Charles C. Clark, is how his mode of transportation changed during his lifetime. Uh, when he came to Royal Grande, he was essentially the area's pediatrician. He was the baby doctor, Dr. Clark. And there's a wonderful photograph of him with his daughter, Lenora, taking about, I would say, 1912 or so in, of all things, an automobile, which he used to make his house calls. But years before, he had been atop a horse. He was 17 years old and a member of a New Jersey Cavalry Regiment in the very last campaign of the Civil War, the Appomattox Campaign, when Lee came out of his trenches at Petersburg made a run for it. Uh, he was hoping to hook up with uh, supplies, including rations, because his men were desperately hungry, and maybe eventually link up with uh, Joseph Johnson's army farther south. Uh, it didn't work out that way, obviously. And one of the reasons it didn't work out is the role the cavalry played in the Appomattox campaign uh, in interdicting supplies and destroying them before Lee's men could get them. And Clark was a part of that. Uh, he, his uh, commander, was uh, uh, one of the youngest generals in the Union Army, a man known for his dash, his elaborate costumes, uh, and his name was George Armstrong Custer. Uh, of course, Custer would meet a different end in 1876, but in 1865, he was a terrific hero. Uh, 
uh, Clark fought for Custer. And it wasn't very glamorous at first. Uh, among their jobs uh, were laying what were called corduroy roads. They were roads where uh, logs would be laid down so that the army could pass. Virginia basically turned to mud in March of April of 1865. So his job was uh, manual labor to make sure the army got moving. Custer would also take place in one of the, the last and most desperate battles of the Civil War at a place called Sailor's Creek. Uh, Custer and his men would go in and help to rout a Confederate army. I think the battle ended that day with the capture of seven Confederate generals. But at this point in the war, <clears throat> the Confederates were exhausted, um, but they were also furious and frustrated. And what was noted about Sailor's Creek is the savagery with which the battle was fought. Uh, the soldiers threw down their rifles and began going after each other with barlow knives and brass knuckles. Uh, that fortunately for both sides lasted only a short time. Once the Confederates ran out of adrenaline, they, they collapsed. And Charles Clark and his comrades and other elements led by Phil Sheridan would capture about 10,000 Confederates that day. So Lee's army was almost extinct. He had one more great chance to break out, but his men needed food. They were literally eating the bark off of trees to stay alive uh, during, the, during the march. And there was a place called Appomattox Courthouse where there was supposed to be a supply train with food waiting for Lee and his men. Uh, George Custer got there first with Charles Clark. Uh, they captured the supply train and it was at that point where Lee realized there, it made no sense to go on fighting. So Clark would have been there, Adam Bear would have been there, several other soldiers would have been in on the final act of the American Civil War. When Lee uh, rode into uh, Wilmer McLean's parlor in Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, and surrendered to Ulysses Grant. And that was the end of the war. But it was the beginning for men like uh, Charles Clark and the other veterans who were buried here you'd give them the chance 20 years later to start their lives over again here in California.